Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for this opportunity of sharing a bit of Shiloh Old Sykes history. Our program is entitled, Miss Julia Remembers. We hope that through this presentation, you will begin to understand some of the ways in which our congregation was impacted by both the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. As you came in, you should have received a printed folder with photos and a brief overview of Shiloh Old Sykes history. If you didn't get a copy when you arrived, I hope that you will ask for one as you leave. Meanwhile, please sit back and enjoy this brief encounter with a significant segment of Fredericksburg's history. It was around 1804 when the first Baptist meeting house was established in Fredericksburg, Virginia. The wooden structure stood near what is now the Fredericksburg train station. The membership included many domineering white folks, enslaved and exploited black folks, and a few individuals that were known locally as free Negroes, though their freedom was in no way equal to that of the whites. By 1818, the congregation was seeking to erect a larger village. A site on the corner of Hanover and Sophia Street was selected. The first brick building on the land is believed to have been erected in the late 1830s or early 40s. It was known as the Shallow Baptist Meeting House. By the late 1840s, the congregation had more than 800 members. Three quarters were people of color. <coughs> There was a large balcony in those days that went three quarters around church. People of color were the majority, but on those Sundays when their owners allowed them to attend, they had to enter through a separate door on this side of the building. The only place they could sit was in the gallery. Only white folks sat on the main floor. For decades, Elite citizens of Fredericksburg were comfortable with the city's political, religious, and social inequities. Then in 1854, <coughs> two birth cries pierced the air. Each cry, unrelated yet analogous, emerged from despair and dejection. One of the, one of the cries was a lusty wail. It came from somewhere inside a slave hut in the Livingston district of Spotsylvania County. In 1854, baby Julia, born in bondage, was welcomed into the world by her enslaved parents, Luvinia and Charles Brown. Little did they know what lay ahead for themselves or their child. In 1854, a second birth cry also broke through the air. It came in the form of a jubilant hallelujah as the colored members of Shallow Baptist emerged free from the circumscriptive womb in which it was bound. Little could baby Julia have foreseen the many ways in which her life and this new congregation's life would become intertwined threads in the beautiful tapestry that is known today as Shallow Baptist Church, Old South. In 1854, the white membership of Shallow began working on a new building. This new building, located on the corner of Princess Anne and Amelia Street, would be reserved exclusively for themselves. Simultaneously, however, Shallow African American members were allowed to begin holding their own services. They gathered on Sunday afternoons in the building where they had long worshiped. On the site, they had long since the liberating of a God who confronted the old pharaohs of this world with truths that inevitably began to shake loose all those who are oppressed. When Israel was in Egypt land, when my people Yeah. 
My, my child, I wish you could have met my mama. Sixteen children she had, all of us born in slavery, out there on Louis Bob's plantation. My mama worked in the big house. She did all the churning and sewing. She was a cook and used to clean. I would follow after her, helping. I liked the dusting best because I could get my hands on the books and pictures that old master had spread all over his reading room. Most times, the missus used to watch me to see that I didn't open it. She didn't want me learning any words. There was one book I was crazy about. I didn't know what it was about, but it had pictures of Indians, kings, and queens. I used to fly to that book and hold it, looking at the pictures while I dusted with the other hand. One day, while I was in the reading room, I heard steps coming from the kitchen. Before I could move, the door opened and someone came in. I thought, sure, it was Mrs., but it was Master. He looked at me and saw what I was doing. But he never said anything. I closed the book real quick and put it back. I was scared for many a day after that. Sure, I was going to get a hit. But I guess he never told Mrs. Back in those days when you looked way out in Pomerania, did you ever get a chance to come to town? Yes, indeed. Sometimes. In fact, I remember one of those times. I was only seven. It was 1861. We were coming into Fredericksburg to celebrate Easter with Mama's friends and to go to the African Baptist Church on Safari Street, which some folks called Water Street. We got up way before dawn, dressed, pinned our passes to our waist, and put some handmade items and a few vegetables in a gun sack. We were going to try to get a little money by selling our things at Market Square. We clambered into a rickety old dray and drove for hours. On our way into town that day, we stopped at a really scary old graveyard. Potter's Field, they called it. Mama grabbed my hand as she told me about lots of slaves that were buried there. Later, we walked down what was then called Commerce Street, and we heard such a rumbling. It was a very large carriage, very spiffy. We jumped to the side to keep from being run over. The man inside was so heavy that the carriage was leaning down on one side. <laughs> there goes Reverend Rose, said Mama. He's the church overseer. But he's a white man, I said. Mama sighed. We can't even serve the Lord, she said, unless there's a white person present. Thinking about it now, I realize folks were probably a little afraid of where our walk with Jesus would lead us. We also stopped briefly that day to wave to Nathan Odell. He was a so-called free Negro and worked as a barber in a very fancy plantation hotel. As we were passing by, I asked Mama about the big old bluff that was standing right in front of the hotel. She shuddered and told me how they sold us slaves from a block to white folks. Mama told me about George <coughs> Allen, too, the slave trader in town, and about the private jail in which he held people. The building's still standing over at Frederick and Charles Streets. Little did I know that I would later meet Mr. Allen myself. But back in 1861, on that spring day, round about Easter, when I'd come into town with Mama, we spotted the courthouse as we wandered down to Market Square. I'd never seen a courthouse, but I heard stories. Because a year or two earlier, Ned, the enslaved keeper of the cemetery, was supposed to be hung in the courthouse yard for messing with two little girls, one white and one colored. Thank God the hanging was called off. 
The governor stopped it. Everything was in a commotion at Market Square. The place was crowded. Coloreds, in particular, were trying to sell their wares. <coughs> Sunday was coming, and they were in a hurry to get their things sold. <coughs> when I asked Mom about it, she said that the city council had passed a law making it illegal for Negroes to sell anything at all on Sundays. Too many had been making money that way. It made the white folks in town uneasy. Later, Mom and I trudged down the street. We wanted to get a glimpse of the church building down by the riverside. For there was always a lot going on for us colored folks at Easter time. Hungry, I sat down beside the road and ate some food from my sack. While I ate, I remember Mama whispering to me about the war. It hadn't come yet to where we were, but people were already talking, wondering what would happen. Finally, she told me about the church and about the service that we'd attend the next morning. While we were sitting there, a couple of men <coughs> that Mama knew came by. Miss Lavinia, nice to see you. I hope you'll come by the surface tomorrow. If you do, you'll get to see the new gas lights. We're so proud, they're the first we've ever had. Mama knew that Brother Roe would be there, keeping an eye on us that Sunday, like he usually did. But she couldn't help wondering what or who would be preaching. You see, it was usually one of our own deacons who brought the message. What a service it will be. Brother Dixon and Brother Walker are both preparing to preach. What a hallelujah time we plan to have at Easter tomorrow. But what about the war? The fighting starts soon after that? Not much happened that year, but on Good Friday of 1862, the year I turned eight, Union troops moved into Falmouth. Lots of white folks had already fled, taking their slaves with them. Tensions were high, but it wasn't until almost Christmas that the storm really broke over Fredericksburg. Of course, I wasn't in town when the fighting started, but everybody that we knew said that the glare of the cannons was like a trampling from the heavens. And, in the flash of those muskets, it almost seemed like some kind of fateful lightning had been set loose. Everybody was wondering what was going to happen. There was fear, and there was excitement.
bars of thunder. The lightning strike within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. here. Still away. He would pull. 
trying to scare us. If we would holler, he'd take to laughing at us. It was something awful. Fortunately, his wife, she was a saint. And the good thing about living in town, it was easy to go to services at church, at least when we weren't working. Of course, after the war, the old building was in terrible shape. Soldiers had torn out pews and furnishings, broken windows, and made a mess of things. They'd even stabled their horses down on the ground floor. Child, you can't imagine how bad it looked. When the devastation ended, our building was a phantom of faded glory. Many of us who had gone, those who had gone to Washington, came back. They gathered with those of us who had remained. And when they saw our building, they wept. But, as it says in scripture, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so, although our building was a mess, we rejoiced. Morning had come. It was the dawn that would call us to a new journey, a journey toward freedom, a journey toward an ever fuller release from the awful treatment we had endured. With shouts of joy and cries of hallelujah, we all began doing what we could to clean up and repair our place of worship. Instead of pews, we brought whatever old chairs or benches we could find and spare. It was a thrilling time. Thanks to emancipation, nobody could tell us that we had to have a white overseer anymore. Brother George Dixon returned to town and became our pastor. He was a gifted orator and a determined organizer. Before the war, Reverend Dixon had been a slave of the Thornton family down in Caroline. But his knowledge of scripture was rich. And even during the 1850s, he had been a preaching deacon here. During the war, he had managed to cross the river. For a time, he was a guide to General McDowell and assisted federal troops. Then, somehow, he found his way to Washington. He was ordained at 19th Street Baptist Church. What a treasure Reverend Dixon was. The services he led were spirit-filled and rich in content. <coughs> Life in Fredericksburg was changing, and our congregation was grown. I witnessed many lively revivals and baptisms down at the river. Sunday after Sunday, we all get to singing. Some Sundays, it seemed like our singing would go on forever. <clears throat> I'm going to lay down my burden. Way down. down back.
Reverend Dixon not only conducted our services, but he went out raising money wherever he could. He even talked the Freedmen's Bureau into granting us $400 to repair the basement where the Army's horses had been kept so we could use the basement as a school. I was so happy and finally being able to read and write. And it was all because of the school at Shiloh. At one point, there were almost 300 enrolled in the Fredericksburg Shiloh Church School. I don't have to tell you, it was the only place in the whole area where people like me could get an education. No one had much money, but it was a lively place even in those days. Shiloh had a young men's association and a debating team. They put on events. We had mighty interesting discussions. I was 24 when Reverend Dixon left to serve another church. It was a hard thing to see him go. He had been the founder of the Virginia Baptist General Convention and he was very active in the community, even local politics. Of course, he had also been our one and only pastor of color. When he left, the church published a notice saying we were looking for a new pastor. We mentioned the modest salary we thought we could pay. Then, with an eye on our history, we proudly added these words. <coughs> No white man need a block. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Lemuel Walden answered the call and stayed with us oh, about three years. During that time, I was living with my family in a house over on George Street. It wasn't very big, just a little place, but there were 23 of us there. Nowhere else to go. I remember 1880, when the census taker came around. My mama, papa, and a whole lot of my brothers and sisters, some with husbands or wives, we were all crowded into a single dwelling on George Street. Just an easy walk from Chido. Many little ones, too. What a time. In 1881, Reverend Willis Robinson became our pastor. He had a style all his own. He was a gifted musician and really went out in his sermons. You could picture what he was talking about. So he drew people by the hundreds. Folks came from all over. There were three services every Sunday plus many revivals and baptizings. There was another side to him, too. And the other side was hard. You see, he had a very strict code for Christian behavior, and he was absolutely unyielding in applying those standards to others. I remember an awful lot of people being put out of the church. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in those days, the old building wasn't in very good shape. It had made it through the war, but just barely. And sometimes, when the river would rise, more damage would be done. Pastor Robinson led rallies. He raised many hundreds of dollars. He knew we needed to undertake some big repairs and renovations. But some in the congregation, trying to be a little extra careful, decided that it was not good to begin the work until all the needed money was fully on hand. What a mistake that was. <laughs> on a June afternoon in 1886, not long after a large crowd had gathered there, the rear wall collapsed. Thank goodness no one was inside. No one was hurt. 
But by then, the repair was impossible. The whole building had to come down. You can imagine the tears that some of us shed. We couldn't stop meeting. Of course, our faith was too important. So we would gather on Sundays over at the courthouse or in a rented building somewhere. Around that time, some property was acquired on higher ground. It was at Princess Anne and Wolf Streets. Some, including Reverend Robinson, wanted to put up a new building over there. Others, including me, wanted to build right on the old site where so much of our history had occurred. What a debate. We had such a division of opinion that a judge had to step in. Finally, the church divided its assets. Some members went over to the new site, while others of us stayed at old site. In 1890, those of us at the old site laid a new cornerstone right on the banks of the Rappahannock. I'll never forget that cornerstone laying. It was a grand occasion. We had speeches and bands and dignitaries of all kinds. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I while he was pastor, 
a congregation grew and grew. We members were faithful, hopeful. We praised God for our many blessings. One of those blessings came in January 1911, when Reverend John C. Diamond was installed as our pastor. He was a graduate of both Hampton Institute and Howard University. My, he was a dynamic preacher whose style could vary from the simple to the spectacular. Some organizations in Fredericksburg, like the Good Samaritan, worked hard to improve our lives, but outside the Negro community, we faced many challenges, indignities, and injustices, strong and deep. The way that Reverend Diamond responded to those indignities was part of what made him so popular. He spoke in vivid, down-to-earth ways about social issues and about the importance of working together for God's kingdom here on earth. It was during my tenure as pastor that the federal government finally paid up for the damages inflicted by Union troops during the war. The white churches in town got almost everything they asked for, but despite eyewitness testimony about what was done at Shiloh, the judge in this case said that we were worth only half of the small amount we had requested. Despite that injustice, I led the congregation in constructing a much needed addition on the riverside of our building. We had over 600 on a roll in those days, and almost everybody was real involved. Under my leadership, we also put stained glass windows in the sanctuary. We built a parsonage on Amelia Street, bought our first piano, and obtained new hymnals to encourage more singing. It was during Reverend Diamond's day that a new kind of singing made its appearance, gospel music. We still sang the old hymns and spirituals, of course, but there were new songs, songs that strengthen our spirit, songs that guided our steps. We wouldn't just sing them at church. we take them home and keep singing them all through the week. These songs understand and understood the lives we were living. Ask me now, gentle say. Came to the Herald, there was never a more eager volunteer 
always ready to assist that junior grade with the perception. In addition to my pastor, I served as principal, teacher, and coach at the Fredericksburg Normal and Industrial Institute. I was attuned to the plight of black people in a prejudiced society. So despite the burden of poll taxes, I encouraged Nick Rose and Fredericksburg to register and vote. And I attempted to help eradicate illiteracy by offering night classes there in the church. Again and again, I stressed the importance of education. I've heard people describe me as a scholarly orator. It's true that I'm meticulous. I take care in what I do. Every sermon is written out, even neatly cataloged. I try to set a positive example in all that I do. It was Miss Julia who first caught a vision for installing a pipe for in a child. But she didn't just have a vision for it. She got to work and organized the club to raise money. By 1927, this woman, who had been born in a slave hut out on the ball plantation of Pennsylvania County, this woman, who had once been in domestic service for Fredericksburg's number one slave trader, she not only had our brand new pipe organ installed, but fully paid for it. It was in January 1939 that I preached Julia Frazier's funeral. She died quietly in her home near the corner of Hawk and Charles Street. Her husband, Peter, had died just two weeks before. Quite a crowd gathered for her funeral. I don't think I will ever forget her spirited disposition or her godlike demeanor. What an exceptional woman. Reverend Lawrence A. Davies came to Shallow Osite in 1962, setting off a whirlwind of activity, shepherding the congregation, improving the edifice, and initiating new ministries and outreach efforts, while simultaneously becoming actively involved in the community. As many of you know, in 1966, he became the first African American to serve on city council. And in 1976, he became the first black person to be elected the city's mayor. He was elected to four more consecutive terms, retiring from that post in 1996 after having served as mayor for the longer than anyone else <laughs> in the city's history. Reverend Davies retired, retired in March 2012 after having served as pastor for, for a full third of the year since the Civil War brought terror and hope to Julia Frazier and so many others who have gathered at Shallow Oversight over the years, right on the banks of the Rappahannock, lifting their voices and living their lives, striving with faith and struggling with hope so that the harmonies of liberty might at last rise as high as the listening skies. Twelve years before Julia Frazier's death, James Weldon Johnson wrote a hymn that reflects the journey and experience of so many who made Shiloh Old Sight their home. The second verse of Jane Weldon Johnson's hymn includes these words. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our people sighed. We have come over a way that has been watered with tears, we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. In a few moments, the participants in today's presentation will be singing the first verse of this great hymn. You will find it on the back next to the last page of the program which you have. And therefore, you are welcome to join all of us as we sing this election. 
But as you listen and as you depart, I hope you will think of this Julia and thousands like her here in Fredericksburg for whom the Emancipation Proclamation was an important step in the long freedom to journey, a journey to freedom. Miss Julia's way may have been watered with tears, but it was strengthened with the courage from on high. At times her feet may have been weary, but like so many others who have worshipped and served Christ at Shiloh Old Site, her spirit was endowed with a love that could not be quenched. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening as Miss Julia took time to remember. Now we will ask you to join us in singing, Lift Every Voice and Sing.